So welcome uh, to this special evening at Billings Farm and Museum. I'm David Simmons, president of the Woodstock Foundation, and we at the foundation are delighted to have partnered with Marsh Billings Rockefeller National Historic Park in bringing tonight's speaker, Tyler Green, from the East Coast, from the West Coast to the East Coast, from California to Woodstock. And over the past few days, uh, Tyler has been conducted research in the Woodstock Foundation's archives here on campus and he has shared some of his research and work with foundation staff and national park staff and to this evening he shares it with all of us. So it's my pleasure to introduce the introducer, um, this, the parks curator Ryan Polk who will introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I will be introducing tonight. Um, I'm, I, I want to thank everybody first for coming here tonight. Um, we haven't done one of these in a while, and I, I wasn't really sure how it would turn out, and we have a great turnout. So um, we have a really good talk tonight here with Tyler Green. Uh, he's the author of Carlton Watkins' Making, Making the West American, and it's about the intersection of art and conservation, about science and technology, and it takes place in California sort of via New England. Um, and we should have some time for questions at the end. And thanks to our partner, Billings Farm and Museum, and the Woodstock Foundation for hosting us tonight. Um, and then together, uh, the National Park and the farm, we own a copy of the 1861 Carlton Watkins Yosemite portfolio. And over the past year, we've partnered together to digitize those images. Um, it's actually the second time that they've been digitized, but now, um, we have super high-res scans that should enable these pictures to be seen widely and used more than ever. And if I could put in a shameless plug, we have eight on exhibit across the street and an exhibit called Creating an American Landscape. So if you haven't seen it at Marsh Billings Rockefeller, please um, take the opportunity through New, uh, October to cross the street and see that. In my opinion, few works of American art can claim such importance as that Yosemite portfolio. It's both a tremendous technical achievement and an artistic masterwork. It's also one of the watershed moments for land conservation and the national park idea. Watkins went on making pictures, <clears throat> excuse me, for 30, almost 30 more years after that. We're just very fortunate that those works survive because without those works, we would know even less. You see, all we know from Watkins is his work. And as I was reading uh, Tyler's book, that really struck me, just how, how difficult a job as a historian it is to work solely from an artist's body of work. And what's even more unusual, I think, for Carlton Watkins is uh, this is an artist who was working in, in nearly the modern era, we're talking the last half of the, of the 19th century, an era where there's a lot of documentation and a paper trail to follow, and Watkins, the poor soul, has left us almost nothing. So that made an impression on me, and as uh, in my you know, poor curator's brain, I, I looked to make comparisons. And as I'm, I'm reading the book, I kept coming back to the same ideas. Um, so follow me on a, on a mild tangent. I am a curator with a, a microphone here, so. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm going to mix a couple metaphors, but I kept coming back to the idea of pastries and outer space. Um, so just, just follow me. It, it'll almost make sense. Just this year in 2019, we had the opportunity to see something no one's ever seen before, and we took a photograph of it. Anybody have any idea what I'm talking about? I see a hand back here. We saw a black hole. Thank you. Um, we've been chasing black holes for a hundred years. Einstein predicted them a little more than a hundred years ago, and we were looking for them ever since. We had an idea that they existed, and all we could do to find them was to look for the things that were predicted to be around them. They're a sort of cosmic neighborhood. So piece by piece, we triangulated our way, and we took a picture of a black hole this year. And then um, on, on a, you know, a much tastier note, I grew up in a town that didn't have Dunkin' Donuts, and, and that's um, pretty hard to believe in New England. But um, 
we referred to munchkins as donut holes. Um, so that, that, that also might be a regional thing, but the idea is the same thing. The idea that you're, you're getting something that was left from the hole. Um, you're enjoying the missing part of the donut. So from black holes to munchkins to Carlton Watkins, it may not be obvious, but I'll try. Um, Tyler Green exhaustively explored Watkins' universe, knowing or you know, perhaps um, hoping to locate Watkins as he researched everything around him. And when you read the book, you, you'll get an idea for just how much everything really is. Um, and l like a detective, he's interviewing his historical suspects and he's going through the dead ends and linkages. And by filling in the world around him, Tyler Green found Carlton Watkins. Watkins was his munchkin. <laughs> and it's an extraordinary story. It, it, it really is. And fortunately for us, some of the great contributors to Watkins' career, some of the people that Tyler has interviewed, uh, came here from New England. And tonight we are on the farm of Frederick Billings. Uh, this, we are in a theater on his model farm tonight. So, who was Carlton Watkins? We have art historian, scholar, and dare I say it, a gentleman here tonight, Tyler Green, uh, to answer that question. Tyler? Thank you, thank you. Um, uh, photography and science, you know, grew up together, right? And, and some of the first things that, uh, the, the, the first places they worked together were, were, were astronomy. And Watkins and scientists worked together um, at Yosemite right away, right? Um, anyway, it is um, fabulous to, to be here. It's, uh, this is my fourth time being here. Oh, also, Chris, me, this is the best I've ever looked at a lectern because I'm standing behind a cow. <laughs> so I love that. Um, it's my fourth time here, um, second time for research. Uh, it's just a great place to work. Um, I'm delighted that a few dignitaries are here. Bob Jolie is here somewhere. There he is. Um, the the uh, head of the, the uh, St. Johnsbury Athenaeum, home to what is probably the greatest Albert Bierstadt ever painted. Um, uh, Watkins and Bierstadt, as we'll see in a moment, were, were um, influenced each other a lot and liked each other not very much. Um, at least I think. Um, and Barbara Bosworth, uh, former artist in residence here, is, is here. Um, uh, her work's terrific and it's up, uh, up across the street now. Um, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about how, you know, we think of the national parks and the creation of the national parks as being um, a western thing. Yosemite is in California, Yellowstone eight years later in Wyoming. Grand Canyon in the early 20th century, Arizona, Sequoia and Kings Canyon and Rainier, west, 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 west. Um, and uh, when I was in school, I was taught that the national parks were a product of the American West, that it was Westerners who came up with them and Westerners gave them to America. The first national forests, the next step of, of, of the landscape conservation idea, they start in the West too. The East doesn't even get one until, what, 1908 Pisgah in Western North Carolina? Um, uh, but the intellectual origins of the national park idea, uh, with, with one exception, um, are entirely from here, from, from New England. The one exception, of course, is Carlton Watkins, um, who grows up in Oneonta, New York, on, in the western foothills of, of the Catskills, um, about, um, Oh, 25, 30 miles from where Thomas Cole lived um, on the Hudson. In fact, the, 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 the turnpike that ran from Oneonta um, ran right past Long Dock, or right to Long Dock, um, that Cole drew and painted so much. Um, so I want to tell the story of why the National Park idea um, is a New England idea. Um, and, and as we'll see, Frederick Billings was um, I mean, you can, I think, uh, if what I think happened and lay out in the book happened, and I think it did, um, I think you could argue that the thing doesn't get done without Fred. Um, the, the New Englanders um, I'm going to talk about are um, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, um, Thomas Stark, who you surely know, um, Thomas Stark King, who um, you might not, 
um, Fred uh, or Fred's um, Billings and Law Olmsted. Um, so before you can get to America caring about a landscape and nature, America has to care about nature. You know, as we moved up, uh, as Americans moved, or as, as, as colonists moved up the um, Atlantic River valleys and then kind of began to work their way west, um, America wasn't, uh, was, you know, mowing down to consume, to, to um, uh, make room for agriculture and, and, and cattle and such. Um, and it was, it was Ralph Waldo Emerson in his great 1836 book, Nature, which of course now you can download for free from places like openlibrary.org um, or buy it in a, new, in a new edition next year that I'm editing, so you could wait. Uh, Emer Emerson writes Nature. He, he self-publishes it. He, he self-publishes about 500 to 1,500. We aren't sure how many copies to start. This is the most common cover. Um, if you look carefully, and it's really hard to see this even when you're holding the book in your hand, um, you see the faint imprints of stuff up there? Those are leaves. Um, so you could buy it this way, or you could buy it with leaves imprinted on a red cover. This was quite normal at the time. Or you could just buy it without a cover and bind it yourself. My favorite of all of the copies that, of, of the original first edition that people bought and um, bound themselves is this one. Uh, leather and gold. Um, this is at the Huntington Library in, 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 in California. Um, and the spine is pretty spectacular, too. Um, it's just an amazing, I mean, um, uh, you know, they have a rule, at, at, as they do at many libraries, that you can't um, have gloves on when you're paging through a book, because then you're rougher with the paper if you have white gloves on. So I was just amazed I could hold this thing in my hand. It's really great. Um, nature uh, is an argument that America, you know, in the early 1830s, America was trying to decide what, what is our natural, national culture? You know, are we just going to copy Europe and everything, or are we going to come up with something of our own? And Emerson um, starts the book with the famous opening, Our Age is Retrospective, um, uh, immediately urging America to look to itself for its own culture. Um, and he offers, um, landscape and nature as a frame for such. And in, in, in what I think is, is, is the most important paragraph of the book, but which to be, to be um, truthful is, is, is uh, somewhat neglected by scholars, it's the third paragraph of the first chapter. And he says, when we speak of nature, we have a distinct but most poetical sense of in the mind. We mean the integrity of impression made by manifold nat natural objects. It is this which distinguishes the tick the stick of timber of the woodcutter from the tree of the poet. The charming landscape which I saw this morning, and he's writing this from Concord, Mass, um, is indubitably made up of some 20 or 30 farms. Miller owns this field, Locke that, and Manning the woodland beyond, but none of them owns the landscape. There is a property in the horizon which no man has, but he whose eye can integrate all the parts. That is, the poet. This is the best part of these men's farms, yet to this their land deeds give no title. Third paragraph of the book, he's challenging capitalism right off the bat. He's saying those private property rights are less important than what we share, or what we might share. Um, that uh, will open the door for, for what's to come in 1864. Um, Emerson urges Americas to build metaphors from nature that address America. Uh, making American culture a reflection of America's land and landscape. Um, he builds nature around a series of reflections. Reflections both as in, hmm, you reflect that way. Um, reflections as circular halves made into a whole. Um, and of course the most important reflection of the book, uh, most important extension of that idea in the book is that um, uh, Americans reflect the land and American government being Republican and a grand Republican experiment reflects the people who create that government and who vote to renew that government at every level. Um, Emerson uh, uh, doesn't get to California until six years, seven years after Yosemite is conserved. His ideas get uh, to California by way of just my favorite uh, how do you not love a guy who's smaller than his lapels? 
and who poses for an oh-so-serious photograph. Not just this one. I got like 20 of these. I mean, I, I, in this presentation, I had like 20 of these. I was going to make you all look at that cowlick again and again. Uh, Thomas Dark King is a Unitarian um, minister in uh, the Boston area. He doesn't go to Harvard. He's self-trained. Um, he's something of a, uh, in some ways, he's the leading celebrity churchman in New England of his time. Um, he's uh, written about in the newspapers all, all the time. He's his own PR agent. Um, here he is with his wife. Um, there's a little hint, Star Will Die Young, as we'll see. Um, and there's a little hint here as to why. Um, anybody, anybody want to hazard a guess? Yeah, you know why? You know why this is a good guess? Why, why we think we might see that here? Oh, so much for the laser. Um, maybe this is the laser? Yeah. So what is he doing here? He's hiding his hands. And in every picture, um, his, he's hiding a hand or his sleeve extends down. Every picture of him we have. He almost, uh, I don't know about almost certainly, he probably had TB of the hand. Um, and it will kill him. This is his wife. Um, in uh, another, uh, uh, you can see in another picture from this same session, Star was about this tall. He's standing on something so that his wife doesn't, isn't almost taller than he is when she's sitting down. Um, uh, Star in 19, 1859, uh, he's an Emerson acolyte. He travels the Lyceum circuit. Emerson gets top billing. Star King gets second. Emerson gets the top check. Uh, Star gets the second biggest check. Um, and they travel all over New England, across the Appalachians to Chicago, Cincinnati. Um, Star is just obsessed with, 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 with Emerson. Um, Emerson signs his name Waldo, using his middle name. Thomas Dark King signs his name Star. Um, in 1859, he writes a book called The White Hills. It is the application of Emerson's ideas as expressed in nature to a specific landscape, the White Hills, uh, the White Mountains in, in New Hampshire. Um, it's a little bit travel book, a little bit history, a little bit science, uh, a little bit art criticism and poetry criticism all wrapped around a celebration of the White Mountains. Um, it's a democratizing of, of Emerson. It's a reflection of Emerson's work. In 18, late 18, 1859 and 1860, Starr never says it in any letters we have, but he's clearly becoming concerned about his health and the Boston climate. He wants to make more money, but it's also clear that war is coming, um, or at least disunion is coming. Um, and Starr asks the leading figure in his church, Henry Whitney Bellows in New York, can you find me a position from which I can be more useful? Bellows gives him two choices, two border cities. Cincinnati, literally a border city. Um, the the, the, the Mid-South slave-owning territory is across the Ohio River. And San Francisco, which is a state uh, which was dominated by, by southern business interests, southern uh, religious leaders, um, southern politicians. Um, California's senior senator uh, uh, owned 200 enslaved people in Mississippi. Um, and Starr decides that he can do most for church and country um, in San Francisco. Um, there's the White Hills. Um, his cover, I assume he just teased Emerson mercilessly about how the cover for his first book was much grander than the cover of Emerson's first book. I mean, I would have. Um, Starr gets to, to California, and um, the leading Republican in the state of California is John C. Fremont. He was the Republican nominee for president in 1856, um, carried only 17% of the vote in his home state of California. <laughs> um, the brains behind John C. Fremont, uh, and, and in my books, the brains before John C. Fremont, uh, the great Jesse Benton Fremont, um, one of the great uh, characters, intellects, um, in our country's history. Um, Star meets Jesse quite soon after arriving in San Francisco and, um, to put it mildly, they are besotted with each other intellectually and otherwise. Um, uh, uh, Star was about five foot two. He looked like a frog and he had a cowlick and, and um, Yet almost from the, the, the start, these two had a particular relationship. There's a, there's a letter from Jesse to Star. Um, Star has apparently told Jesse that his wife is complaining that he's away too much. Yeah. And Jesse writes back, Mrs. King can decide which day she will be bored for my benefit. 
Shut up with myself, I take fancies that become positive wants if they are thwarted. Um, uh, Starr writes letters to his friends back home, how delighted he is that Jesse comes to his lectures, um, and he adds in, a po in, in one postscript, Julia, his wife, will soon weigh 300. I am as slim as ever. Um, uh, yeah, they were quite a pair. Uh, Jesse and John, uh, John C. Fremont uh, own a gold mining estate called, called Las Mariposas. Um, this is Las Mariposas. It's, it was believed to be um, the biggest, wealthiest gold mining state in the world at the time. Um, uh, when uh, Las Mariposas needs to raise money to realize its potential, uh, someone has the idea to hire a photographer to take pictures um, of, of this remote um, out, outpost of mining capitalism. Frederick Billings was familiar with Watkins's work from a court case in which they were on opposite sides. Uh, Billings was a photo buff. It was almost certainly Billings who came up with the idea to hire Watkins to travel to this remote dusty mining region to take a portfolio of, what is it, 30, 40 um, pictures. Some of them are dreadful. Um, this is the first important artwork of the American West. Um, it is the view from a mountain, uh, really the high point, the, the literal high point, of um, the Fremont's estate called Mount Josephine, a name lost to history. You can't find it on a map today. Um, this is looking north. Um, so here's, here, here's a road that the Fremont's um, had built to you know, get, get, get ore and material out of, out of the mountain. And notice how Watkins has lined up the road with the Merced River in the distance. Um, kind of building a metaphor for, for both beauty as potential, um, but here is, here is the river that will help make the mine work. Um, this, this picture exists. We were talking about, about how, how, how much has been lost in one print um, at the J. Paul Getty Museum. This is really the, 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 the first expression of beauty in the West. Um, gold miners did not find the place beautiful. They just found it dusty and hot. Um, Star King found the place beautiful. He and Watkins almost certainly met at one of Jesse Benton Fremont's um, regular salon gatherings. Um, Star King uh, and Billings were not initially friends. Star King was a Unitarian. Billings was an old school, was a Presbyterian and in San Francisco worshiped, worshiped um, at an old school Presbyterian church. I say worshiped in quotes. He joined the church almost certainly because it was the city's big butt business club. Um, all of the city's major businessmen um, went to Calvary Presbyterian, an old school church. Um, Starr and Billings became friends as the crisis over union grew. Um, Billings was slow to union. He was slower to Lincoln. Uh, we're not sure he ever really got to Republican at capital R Republicanism. Um, uh, but as the crisis grew, oh, and Starr was an abolitionist and an arch unionist and a diehard Republican, and it was part of why Billings had sent him, to, uh, why Bellows had sent him to California. Um, so Starr's um, forever teasing Billings about being a Presbyterian, um, especially because it's aligned with the South. So one day, this I, I found this just two days ago, you know, here. Um, so Star King, you know, when you go to someone's office and they were busy, you would leave a calling card. And here was a handwritten card Star wrote on the spot. T.S. King, uh, can Mr. Billings see a heretic for one moment? So whenever he could, Star would just elbow, you know, give him a Unitarian elbow, um, which, uh, and it's in like every letter between them I've ever read. It's, it's so great. Um, in 1860, in December, in, in the summer of 1860, uh, two months, three months after arriving in California, Thomas Starr King goes to Yosemite. Uh, loves it, tells people he loves it, but he doesn't do anything with what he sees there. During the uh, 1860 election campaign, uh, Starr King goes to hear a campaign speech given by Lincoln's friend Edward Baker, who's the first Republican elected to federal office in the West, and Baker urges, uh, asks Californians, do you want to be grubby gold miners forever? Because if you do, if that's all that matters to you, then fine, go align with the South, because all they care is about exploiting the land and exploiting people and using stuff up. They don't write the nation's history. They don't write the nation's poetry. They don't make the nation's art. The North does that. If you want to be a part of the American project, go with the North. Um, and the place, believe it or not, upon hearing that culture mattered, uh, just went bonkers. Uh, Bret Hart, the proto Mark Twain, runs up on the stage with a giant American flag, waves it around. It was, you know, he was a plant, of course. 
Um, people don't travel with giant American flags, um, not even at the end of 1860. Um, and Starr heard in that, uh, I can't fight for the Union, but I can make culture for Union. He'd been making culture uh, in New England, writing, writing The White Hills. Um, he, his response, I think, to what Baker says is to begin writing about Yosemite for northern audiences to learn about. Um, a kind of unionism, to be sure, but cultural unionism. Republicans had no chance to win elections in the far west at that point. Um, culture was the way to build bonds between the west and the north. Um, Star King's eight essays about Yosemite run over about 10 weeks. Um, in the Boston Evening Transcript, the mainstream newspaper in New England. Uh, uh, they were much read, much loved, but ultimately they were somewhat suppressed because over the same period about half of the South, a little more than half the South, leaves the Union. Um, somewhere about this time, uh, presumably at Starr's instigation, Carlton Watkins, this photographer Star King and Jesse have, have met and hung out with, uh, somebody suggests to Watkins that he go to um, uh, Yosemite. Um, Watkins would have known of Yosemite because from the top of this mountain, this is looking north, but if he just literally turned like this, he would have seen 30 miles in, away right down into Yosemite Valley. Um, every major figure in this story first sees Yosemite from the top of this mountain. Today it's covered by cell phone towers. Um, so Watkins goes to Yosemite and makes this amazing suite of, of 33 mammoth plate pictures, the largest outdoor photographs ever made in the world to that point. They would remain, uh, Watkins's pictures would remain the largest made outdoors in the world for another seven years and would never, you know, would not be uh, surpassed until the technology changes uh, in the 1890s. Um, they are kind of amazing. Um, uh, also made 100 stereographs, um, and we'll get to a few of those. This is Half Dome, of course. Um, this is Mount Broderick and Vernal Fall. This is one of my very favorites from 1861. Um, Broderick was a, an anti-slavery um, uh, U.S. senator who was killed in a duel by California's pro-slavery uh, Supreme Court Chief Justice. Um, every mountain around the Yosemite Valley named for uh, an Anglo-American, is named for uh, an anti-slavery unionist. Uh, remember, you know, we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, this is a picture, this is an 1861 picture Watkins called The Lake. Um, that's the lake. We'll come back to that too. Uh, one of the metaphors um, that was most common in uh, Antebe late antebellum and Civil War America is stout trees serving as an emblem of both the strength of the Republican idea, but by 1861 when Watkins makes this picture, also the strength of, of union and unionism. Um, this is the grizzly giant, which uh, I think at the time they thought was the largest tree in the Mariposa Grove, and indeed it may have been, um, 3,000 years old. Um, this was one of the most popular pictures Watkins made in 1861. Asa Gray, the great botanist at Harvard, owned it. Um, Billings owned it. Louis Agassiz bought it. Uh, Louis Agassiz bought it. Um, uh, Benjamin Silliman at Yale bought it. I mean, this was, this was a very popular picture. Um, I mentioned cultural unionism before and how key to the Yosemite idea is that um, Westerners engage the dominant cultural form of the East, which is landscape. Um, this is Frederick Church's 1857 painting Niagara, formerly at the Corcoran Gallery of Art in Washington, now at the National Gallery of Art in Washington. This was by far the most famous painting ever made in America um, in, uh, at, at the time. Uh, Watkins would not have seen the painting. He would have seen a chromolithograph of it. Um, they were all over San Francisco. Uh, what more natural a subject for uh, an artist interested in engaging ideas around unionism in his art than Niagara? This is Watkins's 1861 picture, Cascade. Um, it's between Vernal and Nevada Fall. And I think he's specifically an uh, intentionally addressing church here. Um, the, big, the big sweep of, of, of the water 
addressing churches. Niagara, one of the major aesthetic issues of the day, as put forward by John Ruskin, and as every American artist knew, uh, was uh, Ruskin complained that painters couldn't paint water. He never saw realistic water painted. And indeed, when he saw this church in like 1858 or 59, he exulted that finally a painter had painted water. Um, it was both uh, an embrace of American culture by the old country, but also kind of cemented the painting's success. It would have been a very natural thing for Watkins to have addressed. When Watkins remakes many of his 1861 pictures uh, four years later and five years later, because he has a new fancy lens, um, this is one of just three pictures he didn't remake, and I think that's because in 1861 it did its work. It had done its work. Um, Watkins' uh, pictures were uh, first shown in New York in December of 1862, just as news of the absolute disaster that was the Battle of Fredericksburg um, started arriving in Union newspapers. Um, as, 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 as these pictures go up in uh, a New York art gallery, um, the front pages of the New York papers are covered with lists of dead, wounded, and then and listings of body parts um, that were uh, wounded uh, on the wounded or removed from the wounded. Um, it was a horrific moment. It was the, the lowest moment of the war uh, for the Union was, was, was Fredericksburg at the end of 1862, especially because they knew they wouldn't, there wouldn't be another battle for five months because winter was setting in. Um, Albert Bierstadt is among those who uh, uh, flocks to Goupil's art gallery in New York in December of 1862 and sees Watkins' pictures. He is overwhelmed. He had been trying for a year or more to get the Lincoln administration to allow him to travel west. Uh, the Lincoln administration said it's too dangerous. We don't need artists wandering around battle areas. Uh, Bierstadt sees Watkins' pictures and says, oh, nobody can keep me from going to Yosemite. I'm going there. And so he does. This is a picture he makes in 1872, um, very clearly a riff on the Watkins picture. Um, uh, there are, one, one of the, the, the treasures of this place is uh, what is probably uh, the world's largest collection of Carlton Watkins glass stereographs. Glass stereographs Watkins only made between 1861 and 64. He charged a buck forty for each one. Cardboard stereographs at the same time. He charged a buck for, to give you an idea of what that means monetarily. A cabinet maker in Boston, in uh, in 1861, would have been paid about two dollars a day. So these were these these weren't cheap. Um, there are 67 of them here. Um, there are eight, I think, at the Concord Free Library. There are maybe 10 or 12 at the Getty Museum in L.A. 67. Um, these here um, are, un many of the ones here are unlike the ones I've seen anywhere else. They are on much thicker, heavier glass. I don't know why, um, but this is El Capitan. If you look inside the cover of my book, um, you'll see the mammoth plate version of this picture. Um, this is um, a really influential view. Watkins made these views looking right up or down, as, you know, depending on which side, um, uh, Yosemite Valley. Um, uh, in stereo, these just would have absolutely bounced. Um, and this is Half Dome. This is uh, from a slightly different perspective as the Mammoth Plate, um, but it's a really terrific stereo. Um, anybody recognize this one? Uh, this is across the street. This is Albert Bierstadt's Cathedral Rocks. Um, I think you all have dated it to 1870. 1870 with an ish, yeah, a lot of beer stats are an ish. Like all beer stats are an ish, except for maybe the one up in, maybe yours, Bob. Uh, we know when that one was painted. Um, uh, so uh, this is Cathedral Rocks in Yosemite. And so is that. That's Watkins in 1861. They don't look anything alike. I mean, nothing alike. So what's going on here? Is, is Bierstadt bad, uh, or is Watkins that good, or what's going on here? So what's going on here is uh, Watkins was sitting at Thomas Starr King's knee for a couple of years, soaking up everything Starr had to offer from Emerson. Emerson wrote about how important truthfulness and factuality were. That's both Emerson beginning to embrace early American science, but also um, transcendentalism was born as a response to 
uh, then brand new German research into the Bible that uh, these German scholars had found that many, most of the stories in the Bible were just, you know, stories, mythology. Um, ever after, truth and factualness mattered to Emerson and through Emerson would matter a great deal to 19th century American culture, including to American art. Um, one of the other things Watkins is doing here, the most popular metaphor for union in American poetry and American painting and through Watkins American photography is the joining of water, mountain, forest, and sky. Um, into a system. A, all of these things united to form a view. Um, it's in poem after poem. It's in, it's in uh, painting after painting. We'll see a few in a minute. And so that's, what, that's part of what Watkins is doing here. Bierstadt, alone among major 19th century American painters, was not an Emersonian. Bierstadt was trained uh, in Germany. Um, Bierstadt was trained in a culture uh, informed by the Renaissance in a way that American painting was not. And one of the ways, one of the lessons of the Renaissance was that painters could, indeed should, improve upon nature. Um, fealty to it was not of the highest order. Uh, a painting of it might be. Um, and a painter showing off his skill by improving nature was, was the highest painter of landscape or in terms of portraits, maybe the landscape behind the people in the portraits, etc. cetera. Um, so that's what he's doing here. It is a magnificent painting. Um, in most states in the country, it would be the greatest beer stat. In fact, maybe in every state in the country, but one, maybe two, it would be the greatest beer stat. Um, but you all have St. Johnsbury, so tough. Um, Back to Billings. Um, during, during the war, Billings and Stark, or before the war, Billings and Stark King barnstormed throughout California, traveling to mining camps um, armed, because uh, <laughs> these were mining camps that were for Democrats and often quite Southern in orientation, um, to argue for union and for the Republican Party. And they became quite close during these travels. And then Billings also gave speeches in San Francisco for union. Um, and Starr and Billings become very, very close. So, so I mentioned that, that Billings was a Presbyterian, but he donates lots of money for the construction of Starr's new church um, and for Starr's interests, such as the U.S. Sanitary Commission, which is the Red Cross of its day. When the Union went to war in 1861, and yes, I swear what I'm about to say is true, um, Congress appropriated money for guns, people bought their own uniforms, uh, Congress appropriated money for horses, it did not occur to Congress to appropriate money uh, for the care or burial of Union soldiers. Um, there was no federal money for uh, sewing them up if they were wounded in battle. Um, so the U.S. Sanitary Commission was formed. It was the first kind of mass scale national charity of its sort um, in the Union. Um, California made up 1.2 percent of the Union population uh, during, uh, during the war. Um, California would donate 25% of the funds that the Sanitary Commission um, spent. Um, the major fundraiser was Thomas Starr King. Um, his his, his uh, colleague in arms was Frederick Billings. Um, in um, February of 1864, or late 1863, Billings goes to Washington to lobby, stays at the Willard Hotel talks to congressmen in the lobby of the Willard's Hotel, the place from which we get the word lobbying. Um, he's there to, to, to talk up his business interests in front of Congress. And he's also interested in being, uh, one of the reasons he's giving all these talks for Republican and unionism all over California and San Francisco is because he would like to be senator. Um, and if he can't be senator, he would like a cabinet position in a second Lincoln administration. Um, uh, one morning in early March, he's staying at the Willard. Uh, Billings gets up, goes to his door, gets the newspaper. Um, uh, the right-hand side of the newspaper is bordered in black. Two columns are bordered in black. This is a sign that someone has died. Um, this is a common way of newspapers marking that a prominent person has died. Billings reads the first paragraph and realizes that the man who has died is Thomas Starr King. And he writes an extraordinary letter to his wife. Um, uh, 
and I will read it because it's pretty extraordinary. I'll read a part of it. Um, uh, Julia, dear Julia, the only thought in my mind is Star King is dead. It came so suddenly it stunned me. After a while, tears came to my relief, but I am yet greatly disturbed that he should die in the point of his manhood with all his wealth of intellect while laboring so earnestly and effectively into so generously good work. I cannot understand it. A great darkness seems to have come down upon California. A great light has gone out there. Now that he is dead, are you not glad that you knew him? Have you ever seen a man of such courage, philanthropy, such an unselfish worker? I never did. Uh, we know Billings wrote this because it's, it's across the parking lot. Um, I read this letter on a snowy afternoon. I was three hours late arriving. I'm still sorry about that. <laughs> sorry, I'm still very sorry about that. Um, I almost slid off the road twice and it turns out to have been worth it for this letter alone. Um, historians always dream that, you know, as they're turning the 87th page of the day, having found nothing in the previous 86th, that they will, they will have an aha moment where a great moment of national significance is revealed to them um, by the care and tending of an archive and the presentation of that archive to that scholar. Um, that was me that day. Um, it is one of the most amazing letters of the American 19th century, and the reason is because um, it very strongly suggests that Billings' presence in Washington when Star King dies is what advances the Yosemite idea and the invention of national parks. Um, Star King was the most famous Californian in the East, to two Easterners. Um, he was regularly given credit in the Eastern press for having saved California for Union, uh, and indeed maybe a little bit of credit for having elected Lincoln as well. Um, in late uh, 1863, we don't know when, around a single intersection in, Cal in San Francisco, the intersection of Montgomery and California streets, a group of men and Jesse Benton Fremont, uh, through ways we know not how, began to think, you know, maybe Yosemite is so special and great uh, that we should conserve it, that we should preserve it. This is an idea that nobody in the world had ever had before. Um, the closest was uh, in 1850s France, where the trees, in forest, uh, the, the trees in the forest of Fontainebleau were preserved, but the landscape was not. So mining and quarrying and fishing and everything else continued there. Um, we don't know quite how the idea developed, but everybody we can tell that was important to the idea lived around Montgomery and California streets. Billings built the Montgomery block, uh, the most important office building in San Francisco um, at that intersection. Billings lived at the Occidental Hotel, which was at that intersection, but he also had an apartment in the Montgomery block. Senator John Connus, um, who we'll talk about more in a minute, his office um, in San Francisco was in the Montgomery block. Carlton Watkins uh, lived and worked at that intersection. Uh, Thomas Starr King lived at that intersection, and his church was about six blocks away. Um, uh, Israel Ward Raymond, a disgraced steamship executive who had left who had fled, really, New York um, as fraud allegations rose up against him, uh, lived in Billings' old suite in the Occidental Hotel at that intersection. Um, sometime in December, Raymond signs, but we don't know who wrote, um, a letter to California's Senator John Connus saying that um, it's not the first letter in the process, it's somewhere well along, explaining that Yosemite should be conserved, that there was no timber there that people might want to make profit from, um, and, he, and, 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 and Raymond signs this letter. I mentioned all the mountains uh, above the Yosemite Valley were named for anti-slavery Civil War Unionists. The mountain above uh, the Mariposa Big Tree Grove is named for Raymond, Mount Raymond. Um, this letter uh, arrives in Washington, D.C., and it sits on Connus' desk. He does not move on the idea. Um, Star King dies. Billings is in Washington. The idea moves the next day. Um, uh, Billings' fingerprints are all over it. Um, uh, Connus sends uh, this letter to the General Land Office, which writes up legislative language. Um, the, bill is, uh, the bill is referred to the Committee on Public Lands. The chairman of the Committee on Public Lands, the man who would normally move the bill out of committee, was a senator from Illinois. Uh, a a, 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 a non-committee chairman on that committee was a man named Solomon Foote, who was a friend of Frederick Billings's. He was Vermont senator um, when uh, Frederick 
Billings had worked uh, at the Capitol as a younger man. He had come to know Solomon Foote, who was, I think, the speaker pro tem of the House here. Um, they maintained a friendly correspondence for years. It's Foote who advances the bill out of committee. Um, Billings uh, goes and has meetings at the White House um, in March and April of 1864. Uh, there is no smoking gun letter that it's Billings who gets the thing moving through Washington. Uh, it's, but it's Billings who gets the thing moving through Washington. Um, uh, uh, Billings is as important to the enactment of the National Park idea as Star King is, as Watkins is, as Bierstadt is. Um, uh, this, um, so speaking of Star King's death, uh, this is a, a painting uh, from 1866, but it might be 1865. I mean, you know, as we were. Uh, this is Mount Star King. Um, Bierstadt and Star King were very close friends. The first place Bierstadt goes when he arrives in San Francisco is to visit Star King. Um, this is basically a memorial painting to Star King that Bierstadt made. It's at the Cleveland Museum of Art. It had been mistitled for about 80 years. Um, they retitled it Mount Star King about three weeks ago. Um, that made me very happy. Um, uh, Watkins also made pictures of Mount Star King. Um, it's really hard to see on any picture. It's faded. It was so far away from it. It, it. He couldn't get his camera and his gear up there, at least his mammoth plate gear. It's impossible. I, I've never seen a print where you can really see it, but it's, you know, up there. Uh, take my word for it, because I kind of, an element of faith myself in it. Um, I bet we know who this guy is. We have another New Englander, uh, Connecticut's own Frederick Law Olmsted. Um, Olmsted uh, runs the aforementioned U.S. Sanitary Commission during the war. Um, he is um, at Gettysburg, uh, you know, the day after the battle, tending to the wounded, for example. Um, Olmsted, uh, like Star King, at some point assumes several of his family's debts, um, and he's flat broke. Um, one, and he's getting tired of the Sanitary Commission, just it's wearing him down after three years. Uh, a group of businessmen in New York ask him if he will move to California to run uh, a gold mining estate of which they have recently assumed control, the Las Mariposas estate. Um, Olmsted says, yes, um, I will do that. Um, I will make a lot of money for it and I will get a percentage of the gold found while I am there. I will become rich. Um, Olmsted uh, catches the next boat to San Francisco. Uh, they're waiting for him when the boat arrives. Is Frederick Billings. Um, the two men have dinner. Billings briefs Olmsted on affairs at the estate and they set out for the estate the next morning. Upon getting there, uh, the estate's in crisis at this point. It's in debt. Uh, things aren't working right. There's not enough water. You would think the thing Olmsted might do upon arriving at his job, his very well-paid job, his gold mining estate, was to inspect the gold mine. He might look at the stamping machines or the mine or just go to the office. But he and Billings, probably at Billings' suggestion, decide instead to go up Mount Josephine to look 30 miles to the west and to see Yosemite Valley. So Olmsted, like everybody else, sees Yosemite first from Mount Josephine on uh, the Fremont's estate. Um, uh, not too much longer later, having nothing to do with um, Olmsted and Billings' preference for the view, uh, Las Mariposas more or less goes bust. Um, here's Olmsted. He's made some money on the deal, um, but he's uh, you know, suddenly here in California with nothing to do. Um, uh, when the federal government conserved Yosemite, it did it in the way it normally accomplished policies outside Washington at the time. It gave land to the state with the instruction that it do the thing that Washington wanted, and the state could then choose to accept it or reject it. California uh, discovers that uh, it has been given from the federal government, the Yosemite Valley, if it determines what the borders of a park should be. What a place for resort and recreation, the bill says. Uh, the, the Republican governor of California, Frederick Lowe, whose brother was a business partner of Frederick Law Olmsted's, um, asks Fred, uh, well, you did that Central Park thing. Can you tell us what the heck we ought to do with Yosemite and what it should be? And can you survey it so we can decide what its boundaries will be? And Olmsted, who has like nothing else to do, could not be more delighted. He says, of course I will. Um, and so he writes a report um, in 1865 um, that is known 
it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, you know, if the first most important work of American letters on nature and landscape is Emerson's Nature, um, the next most important document is Olmsted's Yosemite Report. Anybody can read it. You can download it at yosemite.ca.us. Um, it is an extraordinary document. Um, the first paragraph of the document details the nation, the first paragraph of a document on what, on, on a radical idea involving land in a remote far western state is a celebration of art made in the Union during the Civil War. Um, it covers Thomas U. Walter's Statue of Freedom on top of the Capitol Dome. Um, Emanuel Lutz's fresco of the settlement of the West in the U.S. Capitol, several buildings built in New York and Washington that were considered particular architectural masterpieces. And it addresses Carlton Watkins' pictures of Yosemite and Albert Bierstadt's paintings of Yosemite. Um, uh, throughout the report, the report is in, in, in many, many places, and I detail this in the book, um, an almost too direct paraphrase of passages from Emerson's Nature. Um, Olmsted and Emerson knew each other. A, comp a publishing company Olmsted had once owned published one of Emerson's books. Um, Olmsted was, was, was clearly looking back to an old mentor um, and, and indeed extending his ideas. Um, remember this picture from 1861, um, which Watkins, uh, in his own hand, often under the picture is titled The Lake. Um, I mentioned the reflection metaphor earlier. Emerson, uh, Watkins is trying very hard to make reflection metaphors after Emerson for Union in Yosemite. Here's a stereograph of the three brothers. He didn't have a camera big enough to get the Merced River in front of the three brothers in the picture. He makes this stereograph the best he can do with, with technology available. Stereograph was usually titled, not here, um, uh, in the in the in the in the distance stand the gray rocks. What is it? It's a. I'm close. It's something. Like, it, it's a, it's a line from transcendentalist poetry. It's a it's a clear direct link between Emerson's transcendentals and what Watkins was trying to do. This is um, another. He's building reflection into another glass stereograph. I think this one is not here. This is at the Getty. Um, this reflection thing is a really big deal in American art from Emerson uh, even after the Civil War. This is a Frederick Church oil sketch um, at the Cooper Hewitt in New York. Um, Church loved uh, wielding Emersonian reflection to refer to the ideas in Emerson's book, but also in earlier paintings to Union. Um, this is an oil sketch Church made and made a painting of this same scene that he kept himself and hung in his house. Um, the forest, the sky, the reflection in the brook. Um, uh, you can see through the forest, through the brook, you know, uh, in 19th century parlance, God's light coming in, in, in the nature, nature reflecting God's light. Um, my favorite Sanford Gifford painting, The Wilderness, from 1860 at the Toledo Museum of Art. 1860, what was going on in 1860? The Union, uh, as we uh, so often seen in American art, a mountain reflected in a body of water, a union is interrupted. Um, a union is split over land, of course, and what prompted the Civil War, uh, the question of whether the West would be free or open to slavery. Uh, William Sontag, reflection, um, and then notice, as is often the case, red, uh, the, the two guys down here wearing red, white, and blue. I think this is 59. So uh, back to the lake. Um, uh, Watkins tried desperately to get a reflection to happen here. Um, this is the closest he could come. You can sort of see a little bit of this mountain reflected here. Um, in uh, 1865, after writing and turning in his report to the state of California, Olmsted um, writes a letter to Governor Frederick Lowe. As I said before, Lowe's brother was in business over a water company in San Francisco. Um, uh, uh, Olmsted knew that whatever he asked Lowe to do, Lowe would do. For more on that water company, read, I think it's chapter 19 of the book. Um, it's a wild story. Um, 
Olmsted writes to Lowe, uh, quoting a letter that's at the New York Public Library, I enclose a copy of a note to artists in Yosemite, chiefly intended as a recognition of their function in society. And Olmsted asks Lowe to name this mountain after Carlton Watkins. Today it's Mount Watkins, and it's in Yosemite. Um, Olmsted gave the first reading of his report to a group of Republican politicians and businessmen and journalists who had taken a junket, uh, a Civil War celebration tour in the summer of 1865 to the American West. Uh, Watkins was there uh, the night around a campfire. Uh, Olmsted read the report. Um, we know this because there, there, there are pictures of the party that Watkins made. Um, Watkins reads the, uh, Emer uh, Olmsted reads the report. Um, here's Carlton Watkins, um, the eldest son of a tavern keeper in Oneonta, New York. Um, uh, Self-made in every way. He taught himself photography. Um, he lived an American story. Uh, he lived Emersonian self-reliance. He, he moved west, made himself from nothing into something. <coughs> And here on a night in uh, the summer of 1865, he gets to sit there uh, as Olmsted tells the Speaker of the House of Representatives and some of the most important men in America that he had done this, that Watkins was substantially responsible for this new idea. On that trip, Watkins makes this picture. Um, it is, I have come to think, one of the three or four great artworks um, our country has produced. Um, by the time Watkins makes this picture, he knows that Olmsted has named that mountain for him. Um, it is uh, a perfect vis visual synthesis of Emerson's ideas um, about reflection and smaller republicanism and taking metaphors and using American land to make metaphors about America. And of course in 65 or 66, we don't know which year when Watkins makes this picture, the Union is won again. Um, and of course, Watkins wants you to know that this isn't a darkroom trick, so he includes a branch floating in the water down here. Um, I think it's about, I think, I think it's really good. And if you have questions, I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you. Up in the back. Hi. Um, uh, my name is Tim. We talked a little bit earlier. Can you hear me? Yep. We talked a little bit earlier um, in the lobby, and um, I just have some specific questions. Um, did President Lincoln actually physically see the Watkins photographs, Watkins photographs of Yosemite, and was it Billings who provided those to him? Uh, uh, we have no way of knowing for absolute sure, but yes, I think, he, I, I think it's very, 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 very likely that he did. Um, I believe he saw six pictures. Um, uh, we, we don't know how they got to Washington, um, but uh, I tell uh, the story in the book of um, a trip I made to the Andrew Johnson National Historic Site in Greenville, Tennessee, uh, in the western foothills of the Appalachians. Um, where there are six Watkins pictures uh, from 1861. This is one of them. Um, Cascade was another of them. Um, that are on unusually thin cardstock. Uh, mail was a problem during the Civil War from, from California to the east. It was very expensive. Um, what uh, is, uh, the story is in the book, long, long story short, when Johnson left the White House, uh, he took everything that wasn't nailed down. Um, there are couches in houses in Greenville, Tennessee that were in the White House um, that Johnson took back to Greenville with him. I think among the things he took, because uh, they could have al come from really almost no other place, and I explain in the book why I think this, um, the six pictures that Lincoln saw. Um, and they hung on the walls of his house. Uh, Johnson was a Tennessean, but he was a Unionist. And of course, Yosemite was a symbol of the West's commitment to Union, um, and he was from Western Tennessee. And, 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 the, and uh, the foothills of the Appalachians were by any measure uh, of the time the West. Um, so yes, I think he saw six and those were the six. And just one other one, uh, two other ones. <clears throat> Is it clear that Lincoln um, was motivated by those photographs to sign the bill in 1864 to preserve Yosemite? As is so often the case in these things, there's no textual documentation of that. Um, 
uh, Lincoln's overwhelming interest, a lot of historians, far too many historians, have, 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 have written that there was a public upswell of support for Yosemite, that people loved it so much that Congress acted and Lincoln signed the bill. Um, I mean, you know, like a couple dozen people went to Yosemite a year in the early 1860s. Um, there was no popular upswell of support. Um, uh, Lincoln signed the bill uh, because I think presumably the pictures demonstrated it was great, but also because he uh, had won Oregon by 150 votes and California by 700 votes. And he felt like, and he was probably right at the time, that he needed the West's electoral votes to, um, to win re-election in 1864. He needed men like Frederick Billings not to support John C. Fremont, who was running as a radical. Um, he needed men like, like Raymond and Star King, who, who was dead by then, um, to, to support him. Um, and so Yosemite was a way to keep them in line. And one other one. Um, was it philosophically in Lincoln's mind that to preserve Yosemite was a, a thought in the middle of the Civil War, that it was a symbol of public, was, public lands and unification? There's no evidence that it was. Indeed, none of Lincoln's biographers so much as mentions the word Yosemite. Um, a 1950s uh, look at Lincoln's interest in California mentions Yosemite only in a footnote. Um, none of the major survey histories of the Civil War, such as uh, Jim McPherson's Battle Cry of Freedom, mention Yosemite not one bit. Um, historians have whiffed. Okay, and then lastly, um, <laughs> <laughs> let someone else ask a question. Is uh, Yosemite considered the first national park and not Yellowstone? Every historian who has ever written about this considers Yosemite the first national park. Um, the, the, the word, the phrase national park, uh, is, uh, is, it first comes into use in 1872 with Yellowstone. A couple of reasons for that. One, the word nation wasn't used in um, the United States until nearly the end of the war. Um, the, the United States wasn't a nation, it was a union. It was a union of states. Um, Lincoln, indeed, at Gettysburg, which may have been the first time he used the word nation in a speech, um, always speaks of union, but late in the war he begins to realize he needs to provide a rhetorical pathway for the South to re-enter something after the Union wins the war, so he starts using the word nation. Frederick Law Olmsted, no dim bulb, um, notices, and in 1865 or 66, when he founds a weekly newspaper with his friend E.L. Godkin, they name it The Nation. Um, uh, so Yosemite could not have been called a national park. Nobody called anything nation um, back then. In 72, uh, Yellowstone was in Wyoming territory. The way the government got its, its policy way, such as with land-grant universities, was to grant land in a place to the state, and the state would enact the policy because there just was no federal administration to do things in places outside Washington, D.C. Problem. Ye Wyoming's a territory, and it wouldn't become, had no prospects of becoming a state for decades hence. There weren't enough people there. But the place was worth saving. Um, so Congress invented the word National Park. And that's where we get the word. Um, uh, the National Park Service has not told the story well over the years. It has mostly ignored the many historians who've gotten the story right. Um, and the National Park Service's over uh, celebration of its administrative history in 2016 uh, didn't help. Other, yeah, sure. Others? Yes. Do Watkins have much connection to Boybridge? Uh, yes, they did. Um, uh, they knew each other quite early on in California in the late 1850s. We have one of the few, maybe two dozen pieces of paper we have by Watkins's hand as a note to a mine owner saying, uh, you owe me 200 bucks, I'm out of town, or if I'm out of town, give the money you owe me to Moybridge and he'll get it to me. Um, later, uh, they become, Moybridge uh, bounces around America a bit, goes back to the UK for a spell, um, opens his own gallery in like 67, 1867, 68, um, and they become rivals. Moybridge is, with the exception of Yosemite, because anybody who was an artist or picture maker of any kind in California had to have Yosemite pictures, um, Moybridge uh, very wisely pretty much avoids every subject Watkins makes a picture of, except for Yosemite. Um, uh, one of the weird coincidences in history is, of course, as you probably know, Moybridge killed a man. 
uh, for having an affair with his wife. Uh, Moybridge was acquitted in like six minutes by the jury. Um, the, uh, uh, that trial was held a few blocks from the Napa State Hospital for the Insane, which didn't mean that people were insane. It was just kind of a warehousing of, of people who couldn't take care of themselves in California. Um, uh, that, that hospital is where Watkins would die in 1916, just blocks from where Moybridge was acquitted of murder. Others? Any? There we go. So you mentioned that the, and your introducer mentioned that the documentary evidence that Watkins left is slim to zero. About ha about two thirds of what's left are letters in which he complains to his wife about how hot it is in Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think that is? Do you th oh, I can answer that. Yeah, that, I, I, know, I know for sure why that is. There aren't a whole lot of things in Watkins' world we can know for sure, but this one we can nail down. Um, uh, four days uh, in early, uh, mid-April uh, 1906, uh, a curator from Stanford's uh, then nascent museum travels up to San Francisco to meet Carlton Watkins, who was then pretty much forgotten, um, and realizes that Watkins has an astonishing trove of photographs and daguerreotypes and letters and records of his life and business and says, we will welcome these to Stanford um, and put them on our walls and, and own this incredible record. But I am just a, uh, you know, a weakling curator. I need to bring some strong, and this is like literally in the letter, I need to bring some strong Stanford boys up to help me get this stuff onto the train. Uh, and I, they set a date for like five days hence. Four days hence, April 18th, 1906. Um, uh, an earthquake estimated today at 7.8 or 7.9 on the Richter scale hits, Cal hits San Francisco, severs gas lines, two-thirds to three-quarters of the city burns, everything Carlton Watkins owned except for the clothes on his back, quite literally, is destroyed. Oh, thank you for telling me of that story. Um, and can I get a follow-up, which is why so how you you have to approach it tangentially then because mm -hmm. all the primary sources are destroyed not all the primary sources yeah. right so all the primary sources by watkins's hand but we have people writing about him right. we have people writing letters about him writing to him um he's mentioned in newspapers um and of course we have the pictures themselves which are 13 to 1400 of the mammoth plate pictures and probably what 1,500, 2,000 or so stereographs, and maybe another 500 to 1,000 smaller format pictures. Um, so what I, what I did, first I had to accept that I couldn't write a traditional biography wherein, wherein you get a sense of what the guy was like on a day-to-day -day basis. We just don't know. We do know that he, he, he preyed on the help. Um, he, he, got, he got a shop girl at his gallery pregnant, later married her. Um, she was 19, he was 49. Um, uh, but we, other, you know, we couldn't know what he was like, so I wrote a biography-ish. And so my strategy was um, kind of make lists and diagrams of everybody uh, related to a Watkins picture or who was mentioned in a Watkins letter and just kind of built networks of people and over several years, more than that, um, came up with the best guess of what happened. And it's, you know, there are a couple places in the book where I make stabs, uh, um, you know, uh, when, uh, somebody who reviewed the book noted that um, I used the word, words like likely, very likely, probably, a whole lot, but that's all you can do with Watkins. Um, but, but, you know, because I'm not writing now and I'm speaking, I can say if in the book, if it's in the book, I feel pretty good about it. Yeah. It's kind of a long shot, but um, at some point, Watkins lost his business. 1876. And in that loss, all of his work was owned by somebody else. Is, is there anything left of, of that business or any chance of, of following that threat? 1906. We keep getting men answer, asking questions. Hey, wait a there we go. <laughs> What's your best adventures in the Watkins archive story? Um, Oh, I told you to ask that question, too. Uh, what were we talking about when I... It was... 
Oh, this is, oh, because it wasn't me. It yeah. wasn't me. A uh, buddy of mine, Bill Deverell, teaches at SC, uh, and he told me this story. Uh, when he was a GA uh, as a young PhD student at Stanford, uh, one of his jobs was wheeling the carts uh, out of the special collections section of the library to the researchers. And of course, there are all these rules of things you can do around special collections. You can only write in pencil. You can't have a glass of water on the desk. You know, ink, all this stuff. Uh, every Thursday, uh, two old, white-haired, bearded gentlemen uh, walked in like they owned the place, went into a private study room in the back of the library, and every Thursday, uh, Bill was told to get the three Watkins albums Stanford owned, which are like about that, they're about that tall and about that long, they're just huge. One of them is completely covered by a redwood burl. It's bound in a redwood burl. Uh, it's the most amazing thing. I mean, it must have cost, I mean, just unbelievable. Um, and wheel these Watkins albums to these two old dudes in the private study room. And when the Watkins pictures arrived, the two old dudes would take out flasks from their jackets and they'd flip through the Watkinses just throwing back some whiskey. And near the end of the semester, Bill just like couldn't believe this was being allowed. And he walked up to one of the librarians and said, I mean, he knew they had to be special. And he said, how, how, who are those guys? And the librarian looks at him like, like Bill is dumb, which he might have been at that point, and says, well, Bill, don't you know that's Wally Stegner and Ansel Adams? <laughs> I was just going to ask you uh, if uh, Watkins had much of an influence on Ansel Adams. Yeah, huge. Uh, and, and Ansel spent his life trying to hide it. Um, uh, so uh, uh, if, to go through Ansel's Yosemite pictures from the beginning, uh, from the early work, from what, the 20s, um, through the end, uh, he pretty much never makes a Watkins picture. Um, we know he knew the U from a bunch of things, stories like this. Um, in the 1940s, in 42, 43, uh, he curated a show of far western photography for the Museum of Modern Art in New York. He included Watkins's in it. Um, but Ansel was forever trying to cover his tracks on Watkins. Uh, when he was asked uh, at one point later in his career um, who his favorite photographer or artist of Yosemite was, his answer was George Fisk. Raise your hand if you know George Fisk. Ooh, it's pretty good. Um, Fisk was a former Watkins assistant. Um, who was kind of a pictorialist photographer of Yosemite. His work is fine, it's, not, it's, it's good, but it's not great. Um, uh, there has been no, I mean literally no scholarship on uh, comparing uh, Adams and Watkins. The, the Adams estate for years has had an exclusive publishing deal with Little Brown. Um, the, 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 the administration of the estate, uh, the leader of which, the director of which passed away a year or two ago, so this may change going forward. Uh, the estate was not keen on uh, Adams's work, uh, uh, on scholars finding historical precedents uh, and points of engagement for, uh, for Ansel's work. They very much liked that it just kind of stood in an isolated little pyramid. Um, I don't know when that will change. I, 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 it may be a long time. Yeah. Just a tiny question. Yeah. In the portfolio that we have here, all of the pictures have curves at yes. the top two corners. Is that why? Yeah, you're, you're, you are definitely, um, uh, that is a question that comes up a lot, uh, including, there we go. Yeah. Um, so why did Watkins do that? Because that, this is 61, but so is that. Oh, that's not, that's 65, sorry. Uh, but so is that, and it's not curved. So why did he do it? We have no idea. Um, uh, Watkins people have been debating and trying to come up with a reason for years, and I, no one has the foggiest. Um, he, what are some of the suggestions? The best, uh, the, best, uh, the best suggestion, which I think is not convincing. So Watkins is, you know, like I mentioned before, using the largest camera uh, in the world. He designed and built it himself. He's doing that, I think, to compete with painting. Um, in photography galleries in the 1860s, you would walk in, there would be a glass case, and you would look down at the pictures. 
Um, Watkins, uh, every time we know of that he installed his work anywhere, in a gallery, in a fair, um, he hung it on a wall. He sold them framed often. Um, he made them for the wall. It was not uncommon in 1830s and 40s in American painting for painters to make paintings with rounded corners at the top. Thomas Cole did uh, in the 20s and 1830s, and other painters followed Cole's lead. Um, it had pretty much tapered out, and painters had stopped doing that. By the time Watkins uh, starts making pictures in the late 1850s and early 1860s, which is why I think it's far-fetched, um, and California painters didn't do it. So we don't know, but I wish we did. So did other photographers not use rounded plates of that era? I can't <laughs> think of any. Uh, I can't think of any, but there sure might have been. But I, I, not that I recall. And and European photographers never did this. Watkins appears in Europe. There's never been a big <coughs> exhibition, or really even much scholarship, comparing Watkins's work uh, or any American photographer's work to their European contemporaries. Um, but they're all making rectangles. Also, their pictures are much smaller. So most people in Watkins' time who are making outdoor pictures are making pictures about this big. Um, and the Europeans are making pictures a little smaller. Um, so those famous pictures from Antietam, you know, Matthew Brady and Gardner, those are about 80 square inches. These are 400 square inches. Bob? Are there any mammoth plates left? One. Where's that? I should remember, but I don't. <laughs> uh, one. Uh, it was not. Uh, it was in San Francisco. Um, as, as ever, the rich people lived up on the hills. Uh, the hills, there was rock under the hills. The rich people houses did fine. And so there was a glass plate in maybe Charlie Crocker's house? I forget whose, but one of them. But I don't know where it is now. Might be at the Crocker now that I think about it. Yeah. Um, wasn't this a format um, used in stereoscopic? Um, uh, it was, but Watkins never used it in stereo. His stereos are all square, and I'm not sure, in, while that is in stereo, I'm not sure when it comes into stereos. And it might have been after. 1861. In fact, it probably was after 1861. Um, yeah, it's, it's an oddity. Um, and also Watkins, you know, with the same picture, he would sometimes print with, with the corners, you know, square. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an odd, it's a weird one. Yeah. It is a stereographic pictures ever become affordable to the general public? I mean, so that they Yes, they did. Um, and indeed, it, it, it at, um, in the 1870s, when his business went bust, um, his annual uh, stereos started becoming mass produced by Eastern companies, many of which pirated Watkins' pictures. Um, and by the mid-1870s, you could get them for 20 for a dollar. So whereas Watkins was once selling them for a buck or a buck 40, uh, the price fell 95%. And that probably happened sometime in the early to mid 1870s. Everything happened a little bit. No. Oh, they, it was, they, they were, but they were all, they were easy to pirate. I mean, I mean, the, you know, New York publishers would, uh, San Francisco, there were other photography galleries in San Francisco. And when Watkins made a picture they liked, they would hire a, photo a lesser photographer send them to where Watkins had made the picture and said, remake it. Uh, there's an example of that in the book, and that happened with stereos, too. Um, Watkins and the two scientists that led the California Geological Survey uh, published a book in 1864 that was very much influenced by Stars, the White Hills. It was a guidebook to Yosemite with scientific and historical information in Watkins's pictures. Um, somebody at Appleton & Company, the largest publisher in New York, or one of them, uh, took a, a copy of the book back to New York made copies of every Watkins picture in it, and sold them. When did Watkins die, and did he adapt to 
changes in technology <coughs> photography? He died in 1916. He was 89 years old, which for the place in time was aged beyond belief. Um, he, uh, his career peters out in 1890 or so. Um, two things happen. Dry plate photography and Kodak cameras come, come, come online about then. He does adapt and uses dry plate for a series of work in Kern County. Uh, the invention of industrial agriculture and irrigated agriculture um, is, is there and Watkins is involved in that. He makes 900, 870 dry plate pictures there. So he did adapt at the very end when he was 61 years old. Um, that was the last major commission he fulfilled. Well, there was one other the, the, the next year. Um, but in uh, the early 1890s, in his early 60s, he begins to go lame. Um, he has a hip problem, he has a knee problem, kind of reads like arthritis, but who knows. And he begins to lose his sight. Um, he is uh, mostly blind by 1906, can kind of distinguish light, but not much more. Certainly by the time he dies in 1916, He's blind, his grave, uh, he may not have been buried, his grave is not known to us. Um, so the man uh, who gave America Yosemite and much of the West um, died uh, unknown to the land he helped create. Thanks for coming. <laughs>